You are listening to The Insider with Brian Lloyd. The opinions expressed are that of the individuals and can sometimes be of an adult nature. On today's Insider podcast, we are talking to John Crowley, who is the director of Brooklyn. You also directed Intermission, one of my favourite Irish films, and I do genuinely mean that. Um, first off, thanks for talking to us. Um, Pleasure. I suppose my first question is, you know, you've done, you haven't really done period dramas before, I don't think. I mean, like you did that one with uh, Michael Caine, mm. which had it, I suppose, Asians, ha- yeah, Asians, yeah, had, yeah, had had that sort of element to it. But this was very much a period drama. Mm. I suppose, you know, why Brooklyn? Why this? I think it's a profoundly important story that that uh, Cullum has written, and I think it's a really important story for the country, um, and a really important story for the diaspora, and. Um, it feels like a story that hasn't been told before, and that's partly because it's from the point of view of a young woman mm. um, going through what she goes through, and because it's a young woman negotiating her way through, uh, it's, you know, it's the fifties. It's 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 a sort of very paternalistic mm. society. Still, you get a sort of flash lamp shone on that society in a much um, more lucid fashion mm. as you see her negotiating her way through everything she experiences. Um, and but you know mostly that the the thing which is always the reason why you would make one thing as opposed to anything else is the emotional impact that yeah. piece of writing has on you and I I um, find it a devastatingly moving story and that's what we tried to capture and bring to the screen. I mean, was it because you yourself are a member of the diaspora that you felt this connection, or was it just a case of it was a very uniquely Irish story? A bit is the, yeah. is the sort of is the eloquent answer to that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I moved to London when I was like twenty seven. Yeah. Um, but the but the very particular aspect of what that felt like, which um, Saoirse also experienced uh, in the year leading up to when we were making the film, is you know I, I suppose the, the the kind of sadness that comes with homesickness you think is um, not the stuff of a young urban sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I moved to London to direct plays and mm. was very happy and very successfully doing that and, and yet couldn't quite understand why this town that I had been visiting since I was six, London, and loved and in lots of ways knew better than my own hometown. It, it felt different to me when you move there and suddenly it becomes a tougher place to live. And my relationship to home stopped kind of feeling like home in a way and you sort of mm. wind up in a, in a slightly suspended state neither one place nor another mm. and um, that's the exact same thing that happened to Saoirse when she you know moved away um, in the year between we was first meeting to talk about the project and when we actually got to shoot it mm. we moved to London got a flat got a boyfriend sort of had a bit of life in mm. a way and, and um, it, it, it confused her a lot as to why she should be this homesick when she could fly home at any point and could talk yeah. to her mother and you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's a very particular state that and it's, it's universal yeah. and it's got nothing to do with um, economic privation or, mm. the, or the time period that it happens in mm. or even the sort of distance that you've travelled from mm. it's something about growing up and leaving home and realising that, that it's goodbye to a certain chunk of your past you're sort of grieving for something in a way as well mm. so um, so she was readily in that state um, when we were when we were shooting it, and when we met about two weeks before we were due to shoot it, she said, "You know, she asked me, um, does it get any easier? Does it get any easier?'" And uh, I said, "Yeah, I don't, it does." You think? I don't think it does. I think it does, but it's usually about the people that you yeah. surround yourself with. I suppose, truth, yeah. You know, and I suppose and that's kind of in the film what, as that's well. That's in the film is that ultimately that's sort of what home becomes um, the way in which you define it about people you surround yourself with you know mm. um, because the home that you knew of is gone for good and you can go back and be seduced by an idea of it but it's um it's probably illusory mm. that's interesting just on the topic of the uh, of the screenplay as well because like i mean colin tobin's writing you know obviously it's based on his lavender and so on and so forth but you know you know i've read the book and i've read a lot of his work and i do think there is a certain element of i don't want to say coldness but it, it, it is quite emotionally lacking, if you know that sort of way. It's quite, you know, one monotone in that sense, and that you could, and that comes across in the film. I think you know that kind of that the Irish people are very, very reserved, and it's very much you know, down low kind of thing. And then you have Nick Hornby adapting it, and Nick Hornby, you know, he's known for making these lovely, warm scripts, like when he did about a boy and high fidelity and so on and so forth. So my question is, you know, you have Colin Tobin's kind of austereness, and you have Nick Hornby's familiarity. I mean. 
how did you find that mesh together on the page and and working with the script as well? Well, I it's was that your experience even? I mean, did you think? Yeah, I, I not quite. Not, not I mean, because I find Cullum's writing um, subtly emotional, you know. But I think he does uh, write about reserve. If yeah, that's what you mean, and people, you know, pent up emotions very well. Um, but all the emotions are in there, you mm. know. And and if they weren't, they wouldn't be accessible in the film. You know, mm. you wouldn't be able to, to. You can't act what's not there. Yeah, you of course. Know? Yeah. So. Um, but with Nick, what's rather interesting is that you're absolutely right, that that's the nature of his own writing. But when he writes a screenplay, it's not necessarily the thing that he sort of brings to that game. And um, whether, I don't know, I mean, it's, a, it was, it's an incredibly successful screenplay. And whether that's because it's one novelist adapting another novelist, it's, it's difficult to know. But mm. he was lucidly clear about what he felt should stay in and should stay out of the adaptation. And... Um, it seemed very simple to him and very direct. Mm. Um, so uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I never sort of connected the personality of the screenplay necessarily to Colm's own writing or to, to um, Nick's own Nick, writing. Nick, yeah, yeah, yeah. But because um, he's like, I mean, and I, again, <laughs> I don't want to harp on this, but like, he's not one of us. He's not Irish. No. So, but yeah, he really did capture, I think, the Irish personality and the Irish I agree. psyche. I agree. Very much so, I thought. I agree. Which is strange, like, because. You look at other, you know, screenwriters that have adapted Irish books and Irish novels and so yeah. on and so forth. They don't really get it. Yeah. But he did. Yeah. I thought but that was really interesting. I think he had the the, the, the good sense and um, sort of smarts when he was writing it to not attempt to over dramatize it. Mm. And he spotted that the power of the novel is a sort of slow accumulation of of emotion from small events, which mm. are the kind of events that daily life is filled with. And there are no baddies in the story. There's nothing you know, ostensibly bad happens to her. Um, it's people trying to negotiate their way through life and get on with that, with their life and rubbing up against each other in the wrong way. And he spotted that that actually was crucial to the to the slow, um, slow build of power in it. And um, and you know, we were, he was asked a couple of questions when we were screening the film in in in, um, in New York. A few people said, you know, you're you're a very London centric mm. writer. Mm. Did you do a lot of research in Ireland? And he said, no, not at all. No, didn't visit it. He said, um, you know, I reckoned these guys are Irish, so I don't need to be. And and he, he mm. sort of was asked the same question when he when he adapted um Wild, yeah. Cheryl Strayed. Yeah, like, you know, John they said, Did yeah. you do the walk? Did you do the the, the, the walk down the coast? Oh, and he said, he? Well no, she had done it, you know. So so he's very um unprecious and yeah. unpretentious about yeah. that. And you know, his dialogue in the script was, um, he wasn't attempting to write Irish dialogue, which may mm. be part of what's successful about it. It's very mm. lucid and it's almost opaque. Yeah. So that the actors could sit quite happily with it and bring their own personalities to it. And um, uh, But you're right, it's a very, very difficult thing to write, which is Irishness, if mm. you're not Irish. It, it, it is almost guaranteed to get snagged in the barbed wire immediately. Mm. It's, it's going to come up against cliche. Mm. And he very carefully and delicately seemed to sidestep cliche all the time mm. it's been 12 years since your last Irish film yeah because yeah, like you did intermission as I said why did you leave it so long not intentionally really yeah I mean you know the, 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 after intermission I did Boyer with Marco Rowe yeah. and in a strange way that felt like another Irish film because Mark had written it so yeah. it, you know I spent a long time developing Star of the Sea for a while that was going to be the next one and these things you know they, they sort of take time and sometimes they don't come to fruition mm. you know? and um, uh, it's horrifying to me that it's that it's 12 years really yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's horrifying yeah. but like I mean you've done a lot of theatre oh yeah no I mean I've been doing and that's all been Irish I've been busy yeah 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 you know so it's not that I, I haven't been trying to get back home as it yeah. were um, but you know equally it's sort of you know I don't know I mean intermission was so sort of clear in its its identity mm. that um, and Brooklyn couldn't be more different in lots of ways that I probably needed to leave it alone for a while as well yeah. and, and um, make a film from a completely different viewpoint in a completely different um, stage of life mm. you know so interesting do you find a difference between I mean obviously you know obviously there's the practical elements of it there's more kind of going on with a film as opposed to the theatre and so on and so forth but I mean when you boil it down, I mean, is there a difference between theatre and film for you as a director? Or yeah. is it just a case of it's just the work and that's it? Um, well, it, they both are just the work, right? Mm. Is the truth. That, that's the kick you get out of them. I mean, yeah. Because if you're not 
actually passionately engaged in in the work in, mm. in what's exciting you about it as opposed to the effect it's going to have on people um, you probably shouldn't be doing it and it probably won't work very well and uh, when it does actually wind its way out into the into the world because you're sort of acting in bad faith somehow mm. um, but in terms of the difference between them there's, there's some very profound differences you know I mean obviously look the similarities you're telling stories with actors in both cases and um, the way you direct actors tends to be very similar the process in both cases could not be more different, mm. you know, and the process of making a film is basically like an industrial process, which is, you know, a huge military operation, um, but which is all about capturing something fleeting, which is sort of 10 seconds or 30 seconds of a take mm. in which you're given a position of, of, of power and authority to say, yeah, that's good, or no, we need to go one more, we need to go five more, until you, you intuit get what yeah, yeah, yeah. something you know, very difficult to pin down, which is in a piece of emotional truth. And it's kind of incredible that that whole machine will sort of operate to try and get those little pieces that you stitch together, those beads that you're gonna put on a string, and hopefully the whole thing then mm. hangs together. Um, in the theatre, it is so much more about a, a writer and an actor's medium, yeah. you know, um, or certainly the kind of theatre that I, that yeah, that yeah, I yeah, tend yeah. to do, you know. Um, and there, your ego takes far more of a back seat, and it's very refreshing that it's sort of not about you. Really? Not to say that films are about you either, because the films I make tend not to be, um, they tend not to scream, look at me, they tend to sort of be about, look at this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, in the in in the theatre, your job is to sort of guide those actors to the heart of the writing in a way that's as fresh and spontaneous, and that you can create the conditions for that event to happen eight times a week, or mm. however many times it needs mm. to be repeated. Which is a very different kind of task to trying to get a moment's truth once mm. in front of a camera, and you hope the camera's turned on and it's mm. in focus, and once yeah, you've got yeah. it, you've got it forever. Um, but ultimately, from that point on, it's a dead thing. You know, it's it's captured. You know, and you were then stitching it together, which, yeah. which creates something in a room, yeah. which is sort of living and breathing through an audience's eyes. But it's a dead object. So by the time you finish editing it, and by the time you have cut this whole thing together, and yeah. you know, mixed it, and basically every additional element that goes into filmmaking all the way down the line, right, mm. is um, it's something which is over. It's it's been done like six months ago, and you carry on, and yet you're taking it out into the world. In the theater, it's it's starts from scratch every night you know because it, it's like you have an audience in, in, in encountering yeah. that play yeah um and the subtle differences which usually you're the only person maybe the player whoever watches it with you mm. I mean, you're the only people who can really see the differences between one form and another mm. the audience only sees the play once usually um but it's never quite the same there's no two performances that are ever mm. quite the same and that's what's amazing about it and that's what's maddening about it because it's written in the wind so when something really special happens in a theater it's gone yeah it's goodbye you know and if you weren't there you weren't there you missed it and if you capture a really special moment on camera it's You've there got it forever. forever and so there are a few moments where the camera was on <clears throat> Saoirse's face and something very very specific and special and magical happened on mm. the day and you kind of have a feeling that something special is unfolding when you're on set, but it's like on to the next yeah, thing. Yeah, you look yeah, back yeah. over the rushes the next night, you go, oh my God. You know, yeah, she really got it there. Six months later, you're still looking at it going, oh my God, that's really something. But it sounds like you like you prefer theatre more than film. No, I don't. Really? No, no. You don't have any preference between the two? No, I prefer making films. Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. But, I, but I do love... Um, to go and direct a play having been working on a film I mean, yeah. so, so when I say a film is a dead thing that sounds like it's been pejorative it's yeah. not, not at all I mean you're making something it's just you know when you're, when you're working with actors it's a, it's a live process yeah of course yeah. you know and you know I was, I was amazed with intermission when we went into the, into the cutting room that I could say to the editor can I watch that again and I could watch a scene 15 times mm. you know you can't do that with a when scene you're, in the yeah, of course, you can't yeah. say to the actors let's do it again I don't know what's wrong with it let's do it again I don't know you know you, yeah, 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 it's yeah. a very different kind of process so um, but I think that the kind of uh, the, the time it takes to make a film allows you um, a quality of thought about it mm. which is exceptional and theatre is much more to the moment mm. um, and uh, yeah, I couldn't live without making films. It's interesting and funny that you mentioned that <clears throat> you, you described uh, making a film as an industrial process. Yeah. And you worked on True Detective. Yeah. Now, I'd like to put a quote to you from David Cronenberg. I don't know if you've seen this. Did you see his interview he did? No. Okay. He said when he was talking about True Detective, and this is what he said, he said, I considered it, but I thought the script was bad and I didn't do it. And in TV, the director is just a traffic cop. 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't want to challenge you, but I mean, what, right. what, 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 what's your take? I mean, do you see yourself as a traffic cop? Because you look a, you look a true detective, and that was such an expansive story. Yeah. You know, Nick Pizzolato, he created this massive yeah, yeah, yeah. story, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and it does feel like that. You know, one director could come in and do it and just do that episode. Like, mm. you did Omega Station and you did... What was the other one? The finale. The finale. Well, yeah, no, Omega, five, five, Omega, Omega Station, Station was the finale. finale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did five and eight. Right? Yeah. yeah, five and eight. And they were, they were renamed. Were they? Down the line, yeah. He, he was always reworking the titles of this of the episodes. Was yeah. he? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, what's your, what was your take on it, working on a series like that? Was I a traffic cop? Um, I would hope not. I mean, you know... It didn't seem like... I'll tell you right now, and again, I'm not just saying this because yeah. you're here... The final episode was the best episode of the series. The bit when he goes into the when he goes into the log cabin yes. when he puts on that yeah. was fucking fantastic. Sorry. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he, look, it's it's difficult because um, I think I I think Nick's a great writer, um, and but you you know you you are a gun for hire. It's the simple truth, mm. and I did know that in going into it. It was that you know you're because I was coming in to do episode five, mm. and the four episodes down. And the piece has sort of already found its feet. It has a certain kind of a direction. And yeah. there's certain opinions formed about what they do like and they don't like in terms of shooting style or in terms of, you know. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I think I brought a lot of stuff to bear on the actors, really, in terms yeah. of performance, nuance. And um, you just bring your taste to it. And mm. I had a very happy time with Nick on set. Okay. Um, and I knew him from before. I mean, it, this is how it came about. I mean, I developed a film with him based on Galveston on his novel. Really? Which, yeah. So, um, so it. Um, but it's you are definitely part of a wider uh, a machine. System. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, you, you can't kid yourself that you're in any way in the driving seat of the overall feel of it, unless you're mm. going to do all all eight episodes, which is what they had done in the first series, yeah, and which course, they yeah. didn't want to do in the in the second series. So it was a very specific job that you had which was to um, not interfere with anything that was going on already, mm. not unsettle actors to try and help. And of you're course, taking yeah. in performances which have already are on a certain arc and you've mm. got to try and figure out where they've been going and see, you know, and certainly in episode five, a lot of, a lot of change for those characters. So there was mm. a lot of interesting work for them to do emotionally. All of those characters had big shifts. So yeah. it was a very fun one to, to, to do for the first episode because it was really performance based mm. um, and uh, uh, it was a very happy experience that you know um, and the finale was a huge beast of a thing because yeah. it was 90 minutes long and in lots of ways we didn't have enough time to do it and there were big set pieces as you know in it which mm. is an almost more genre yeah style of thing um, I mean the whole the whole series was very genre based very, I mean it was very much a noir yeah, yeah, LA noir so. like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, but we got to do things on, yeah. on that finale which you know, I wouldn't. I would never get to do in a film because I probably wouldn't wind up wanting to make that kind of film. So in a way, it was a bit like enjoying being a day tripper. Yeah, and, just kind of like so, dipping your feet, dipping your you know feet in the water kind yeah, of thing. Shooting out in the desert and the redwoods and shootouts and the you know the, the log cabin. I mean, it's you know I'm I I'm not a genre director and it's not really stuff that that is of interest to me. You know and um, so having done Brooklyn, which was very you know you put your, your blood, sweat and tears into mm. it for a year and a half, um, it was the perfect thing for me to go and do, because mm. we're talking about theatre as well, is that any time you complete a film, you sort of have to go and do something which is the exact opposite of Yeah, of course, a palate cleanser. And, yeah, a palate cleanser. And ideally, it's not about you. Mm. It's just, that's, it's one where you just put your ego in the back seat and you go to work for a while, mm. and then you can come back and do something else again, where... Um, it is more about what you want to do for the overall piece, mm. you know. So, you know, it, 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 where you don't choose your crew, you don't choose the cast. It's uh, you, your job is very particular. Mm. Um, but I didn't have a bad time in it. I mm. have, you know, it was a, it was a great experience. Mm. As a, I mean, <clears throat> and again, you know, I, I really want to stress this, and I'm, I'm being devil's advocate. I really did like it. I did. I really did enjoy it. But you, as you know yourself, I mean, there were, there were quite a number of pieces and there was not so much the, you know, joyous reaction that there was to the first season. The second season was a little bit more mixed. And we uh, we have another podcast um, and we interviewed Colin Farrell about it and he was asked about it. And he thought, he had, he had, a, few, he had a few opinions on it. Mm. I'm just wondering, you yourself, I mean, 
it's something like True Detective that is going to be watched by everyone, is going to be commented and opinionated on by everyone. I mean, how did you find that? I mean, how did you find that, the fact that there was that such intense focus on I, your work? Uh, I was sort of amazed at the scale of it, but I think that, um, you know, I don't read all that stuff for a start, right, is the truth. And when I started broadcasting, yeah. um, I was in Australia directing a play. <laughs> <laughs> and very happy directing a play. Yeah. So that was where my focus was. I was kind of amazed by the negativity that, that people wanted it to not be, in a way, as good as the first series or something. You, you think know? people had hatchets out for it? I think, that, I think that there was, early on, people were expecting it to not, to not be as good and they sort of, they were damning of it. And in a way, yeah. it was a slower build, this series, and it, and it needed a few episodes to kind of, you know, it was a wider palette that yeah. it was playing with, um, more characters, more mm. complex, and really for all of those stories to kick in it it needed a few episodes to do that and and arguably the first series didn't it was off to the races with one maybe two episodes you were in mm. um so and that maybe it's the format maybe it's the fact that he wants to reinvent it every time mm. maybe that's difficult maybe you would create too much much anticipation i don't know who knows mm. to bring it back now to brooklyn yep. i mean obviously this has been doing very very well i mean it's gotten all sorts of you know awards and so on and so forth um there's talk of an Oscar. There, there is. It's. It, they say it's in contention. I mean, what do you think? I mean, what, I mean, how do you how do you take the whole sort of Oscar buzz, if you like? Uh, how do you deal with, it? with a pinch of salt? Because really? it's, it, well, it's rumor. I mean, you know, it basically is, and it's. I mean, it's very nice that certain sort of film journalists are are you know they're. It's like you know ranking racehorses. You yeah. Know, that they're that they're talking about in those terms. It's fantastic, right? Mm. And. No film that I've ever made before has been, should we say, bothered by this level of attention. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. that's great. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, it would be awful if that's the sort of dominant kind of subject of conversation because somehow, you know, that's not why anybody who made the film yeah. was, got involved in it for. Yeah, yeah, of course, we, yeah. we, we, we all thought we were making a small, slightly sad story of profound importance about immigration from mm. this country, which is absolutely relevant. To Today, me. yeah, very much so. So the fact that it's taken on a little bit of sort of showbiz glamour is amazing. Mm. And, um, but yeah, I think you have to take that stuff with a pinch of salt because everybody gets sort of goes a bit mad about it at yeah. this time of year, you know, and it's, and it's such a crammed marketplace. And But thankfully, audiences that see the film are responding to the film, mm. you know, and um, that's great. That said, I think that Saoirse Ronan deserves every award going for what yeah. she's done in the film. And I can say that as objectively as I can. Yeah, as yeah, director, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know, I think that she's completely redrawn the boundary on people's expectation of just how much of a heavyweight she is as an mm. actress. I think, it's a, I think it's an astonishing performance that she's giving. Mm. So... Go Searsha. <laughs> Go Searsha, absolutely. Just, on, just actually funny on the topic of audiences and, you know, how, how they've been responding to it and so forth. I mean, I mean, have you noticed much of a difference between, say, an Irish audience responding to it as opposed to, I don't know, an American audience responding to it? Because don't forget, like, I mean, emigration, as, you, as well you know, like, I mean, it is ingrained in our culture, you know, that sort of way. It is very much a case of it is just a part of, of our society and our culture. Mm. Whereas Americans... Maybe not so much, mm. or even English people not so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just wondering. I mean, how is the, how has the reaction been? Do they respond to the same teams? Uh, slightly different, if I'm yeah. honest. Now, bear, bear in mind, I've only seen one full Irish screening, which was really? last night. Yeah, because I haven't sat in any of the, of the, of the press screenings here. You know, so um, last night was the first one that I watched with a full audience in the Savoy. Yeah, um, and there's an immediacy to the reaction. Um, with the humour mm. the film that obviously plays here there's a mm. recognition factor mm. um, that's very particular and when it plays in America there are other factors that come into play that there's you know in a way there's humour that it's mm. in the American section um, there's, a, there's a scene on Long Island before it looks like Long Island which is in a field yeah yeah and that in lots of ways was the biggest laugh that we got in the in the states which is when you see when he says do you want to live out here on Long Island and they're <laughs> in a field and they, they you know they love that yeah so, yeah 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 um so whereas here it's 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 that's not necessarily the, no, the sort of we wouldn't get it. the joke at no. all so it's fascinating because you see both sides of it now I was more nervous in a way about it playing in London because as you rightly point out Ireland, England has a very different relationship to 
Immigration. Immigration. Yeah. And it really is immigration. There's no emigration from mm. England. So the idea of leaving your homeland is is a very sort of fragmented one there. It, it, it's not, the you know, our relation to it in this country, it's like it's one of the defining facts yeah. of life in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and America's relationship to it is one of, uh, you know, genealogy. I mean, everybody mm. sort of has a story about how they came to the to the um, the new country, as it were. So, um, and what was the English reaction like? It, the emotion of it played, which I was very surprised by. That it, the, the universality of the emotion played in a way, mm. and the romance of the that sort of love triangle came across very strongly. Um, so I was I was really pleased. That it mm. did, um, but obviously it has a pull. You get reactions in America which are incredibly powerful. About people seem to need to want to talk about their own story. Yeah. They see their story reflected in the film. Mm. So at Q and A's, we would frequently have somebody stand up before they ask the and question just tell and just their say, whole story. "Well, before they ask what question they want to ask about the film, they go, thank you. Um, my grandmother, my grandfather came over from Kerry. I've, you know, they, they yeah, would just yeah, yeah. have to say that, that story. Yeah. Um, I own a bit of that story. So, yeah. so they, they were taking ownership over it and then want to know about how we shot this scene or that scene or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's very particular and um, actually quite a prof- profound thing that happens because mm. people are sort of, uh, that was the main thing that was that was incredible in, in in New York was watching them sort of take ownership of the film. Yeah. Go, oh yeah, this is. A, whereas I was nervous, of course. We were a couple of blowins making this film called yeah. Brooklyn. Who are we to to, to to front up there and yeah, you know, yeah, 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 Brooklyn yeah. and especially because we shot a lot of it in Montreal. Yeah, and, you know, I saw that. So, actually, yeah. Um, but thankfully, at one of the Q and A, somebody stood up and said, "How how many weeks did you shoot in New York?" And we said two days, and there was this like gasp, gasp in the yeah, audience. Yeah. So. It seemed to pass muster on that level, you know. That's all we could. Um, final topic now, and I, and I just, just re- kind of very briefly on this. But I mean, I mean, what are you working on next? I mean, are you going to keep continue on? Are you going to go back to theatre? Have you got a film lined up? I just did a play in Australia with Kate Blanchett and our company there, so um, we might take that to the states next year. And um, I don't know what I'm going to make next. Is the simple answer. It's got okay. A, there's a bunch of things hovering. Yeah. Um, but I haven't nominated which one is next but I'd like to make another film next yeah. would you yeah. I mean are you going to stay in this kind of like smaller do you, I mean do you see yourself moving on to something wider or bigger no really yeah talk to me in a year and I'll be on some massive franchise <laughs> thing and I'll be, you'll be but, doing Star but, Wars or something <laughs> like that you got Donnelly yeah, yeah no you, you should never probably say these things but no look the truth is um, I am very comfortable with this level of storytelling right and, mm. it, and it speaks to um, my strengths I feel um, the truth is I'm not I don't get excited by genre and I don't really get excited by CGI anymore. yeah you know it just doesn't it, it just doesn't excite me I want that stuff to be completely invisible in whatever I make I want it to be mm. folded into the background yeah and yeah human emotion and human faces interest me a lot more so that necessarily means you're sort of wanting to make dramas rather yeah. than big splashy things but um, uh who knows, you know, who knows? I mean, it's, it, it all unfolds from project to project. And I, and I don't feel the burden of having to sort of um, be any kind of a self-invented auteur, that there's this, a theme that I need to re- return to. Mm. It's really reading and responding to, you know, a, a piece of writing that mm. you feel you have a shot at doing really well, mm. that you're arrogant enough to think you can contribute something to <laughs> is what excites me, um, rather than being sort of calculating about it and going, okay, done this budget level, you know. Let's move on. Let's move on to something something bigger. Because, you know, the bigger the budget, the more interference, as far as I can see. Yeah. Just, it, it, that stuff is a whole different job then, you know, it's, it, it stops being about directing and it becomes about being an advocate for something or Mm. a sort of. Political. A defense lawyer in, in in defending it. And there's a certain amount of that with any film, you know, I mean, Mm. even small, you know, TV project like Boy A, you will always have, a certain part of the editing process is about protecting what the original vision of the story was mm. because um, editing is always a perilous um, part of the process and people watching it can lose their nerve about something and sort of suggest that things should move in one direction or another and mm. um, you sometimes hope that or you somehow hope that um, you're surrounded by people who, who don't lose their nerve and mm. you know that will stay true to what you set out to do Did you have some of that in True Detective? 
which the ed pro issues with editing like issues not, in terms of not remotely no. really yeah no I mean I, I handed over my cut to Nick I think he made three adjustments for episode five and a, and a handful on on the last episode so and he just no, put he it incredibly he's incredibly respectful so you're looking at me amazed I'm surprised I, no I really am just because like I mean like again like uh, obviously I'm you know I'm working off second hand information but like the kind of stuff you heard about this second season was that he was very controlling that he was very much this that and the other so it's surprising to hear from somebody yeah, who was actually was, involved was, but we worked very closely on set and he was yeah. really you know I think they had a, a bumpy ride on the on the second one you know and mm. um, but I didn't have a bumpy yeah. ride on the second one you know and it's like working with a great playwright in the room, you know? It's like he created it. Yeah. And your job is to realize it. Mm. And I think once he spotted that, I wasn't trying to take anything away from it. it yeah, was, yeah, It yeah. was fine. You're trying to realize something. And, yeah. you know, I had worked with Colin before, and so my relationship with the actors was great. And mm. it was, you know, it was, it was a very busy set because mm. there was so much to do all the time. Mm. But it was also a very happy set, mm. you know? Um, so no, I mean the editing was very straightforward. But you know, you hand it over. It's that's the difference in the in, yeah. in film. You you hand nothing over. You 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 have to be there right until yeah, the last yeah, moment yeah, yeah. In, in the mix, the sound mix. Mm. You know, um, whereas in film you're hard for that period. You you know do the prep, you shoot, you do your cut, you mm. hand it over. Yeah, and that's it. And you have to be okay with that. You know, you yeah. sort, it's sort of. I mean, Peter Not being precious, the theater, you can't be precious. Yeah. and I'm, and I wasn't, and sort of you know, and and to go in under under that sort of, if you did go in there and you were harboring secret mm. desires, you would come away resenting it, all, mm. you know. But it was a great ride. I mean, it really was, and um, was a, was an amazing experience to see how ama American TV mm. of that standard gets made. You know, would you go back for a third? I don't think it's really. It's up to you. My kind of. Thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it, the, the the life of a sort of jobbing American TV director is a, is an odd one I mean, because mm. they do have to parachute in, yeah. do a very particular job, and then leave. And so there were certain directors on like, it. off to do Ray Donovan the week after? Who off to do? You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like Alan find, Taylor is big for that kind of thing. Like. I would find that sort of um, that would that would be like schizophrenia for me. After all, I can do it once. I could, yeah, I could jump in on one thing and see. Oh, this is great. This is a um, like a, a, a roller coaster. Do yeah, it and and, and off you off. get. But um, it's not something which I felt, oh yeah, this is really what I sort of want to spend the rest of my life doing. I mean, directing films is what I want to spend the rest of my life doing and directing plays is what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, it, was a, it was, but it was the perfect thing to do at the, at the right time. At the right time. And, yeah. Very and cool. I'm really proud of it. I mean, that's the, oh, you should be. You know, yeah. I sort of, I don't understand the, the quite, I understand the negativity, but I don't, I don't yeah, understand yeah, it, yeah. if you know what I mean. I don't quite know why it didn't find a few more champions in the world. Mm. You know, because it's ambitious work, and really um, was. Anyway, yeah. No I, no, I mean, honestly, I mean, it, I, I, I've, I've said this before. Like, I, I could really see what they were going for. They were kind of trying to channel that kind of, you know, Chinatown. Yeah. LA Confidential kind of vibe just and this is really not a final question now. I mean were there any films that you watched during the production of uh, True Detective and Brooklyn as well I mean do you watch films during pre-production to kind of give yourself a little bit of a, a little bit of a creative yeah, edge yeah a lot I mean you know it's, it's like with um, you know when you're, when you're developing a dialogue with a DP in particular and um, mm. with a designer you know there would be certain films that you would you would reference mm. and you would often then look at, at parts of them yeah right? and um sometimes it's in order to define what you're not doing so the godfather 2 became very important in lots of ways right because that is the sort of epic version of what it means to come to america mm. and this is so, for brooklyn now yes for brooklyn really now. yes because also um there you go that's that's, that's, the that's what i'm saying yeah that was like like, like god like it's godfather one brooklyn. i had a good time on true detective and secondly godfather 2 is the thing Blowing that we looked at. um uh, the, the, there's a couple of reasons. One is is Gordon Willis's lighting was yeah, a, was, a, was, gorgeous. A, was a key reference in lots of ways to us, and um, the nature of the story obviously could not be more difficult. But it was very important for us to look at you know the the section in Ellis Island cannot be done better than it was done in in Godfather Two. Now, and at one point we were uh, you know. There was a section in, in Ellis Island because then we did a bit of research and found out actually it can't be Ellis Island because they stopped processing in 1924 for mm. people entering the States in that way. So it was on a, on a pier, which is what it was, in a big warehouse for mm. Ailish. 
Um, but you look at that film in order to define something opposite to it. You know, that that's, there's a scale there and we're looking at the opposite scale. And mm. there's something there that if you attempted to replicate, you would wind up mired in cliche. Yeah. Right. And that was very important. It was that you have one eye on all of these things. It's just how to do that. There were a bunch of other films in trying to figure out a visual language for um, how to represent Eilish's split, what mm. happens to her when she leaves. Like there was the double life of Veronique, you know, Persona, mm. Bergman. I mean, they're, they're sort of extreme, almost art house examples. But, it, you know, the aesthetic of the film is sort of European and, and American yeah. in a way, right? There's a lot of handheld stuff in there. There's a lot of jump cutting and, and it gradually builds into something more classical. And it, in my head, it was a sort of bizarre cross between the Darden brothers and John Ford, you know, that it was sort of two extreme, yeah, yeah, very contradictory extreme, yeah. things. And if we could make them all work mm. and... Um, Yves Boulanger, who shot it, who had shot Dallas Buyers Club, which was the film that I loved. And, and that was the film I saw that, in a way, put, you know, that's why we wanted him for this. And yeah. it was all handheld and grainy. Yeah. And, you know, it was sort of, um, uh, it was as we kept working on this, I was nervous that if we did something too classical with this, that we would get, you know, get mired in cliche and that mm. it needed a degree of freshness. And, you know, I wanted it to be period in a way that would be thrown away. That yeah. Would, that, that we would wear the period detail. It very would just lightly, be in the background. Just like always in the background. Yeah. And never foregrounded. And that mm. it wouldn't be theatrical in that way. And mm. that it wouldn't feel like, you know... Um, like a stodgy period drama where totally, everything is up that's to That's what the you front. expect. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Instead, we're making a film about a face. Mm. And, um, uh, and he was a great collaborator with that. So we went on a whole journey of watching bits and pieces together and looking at, you know, which is what you do. You just develop mm. your style and... And usually when you're heading into it, you have a certain number of elements which often feel contradictory. You think, mm. how will all of this knit together? Because have we got, you know, because it's, you know, it's not that you've got a, a rule book. If you're mm. trying to mix styles, you're hoping that what you're trying to do, the reason why you're doing that is to try and get a degree of emotional um, immediacy for yeah. the viewer rather than ever referencing those films. And there's, I would never consciously try and reference another film in a film it just it isn't a game I play you know you just, it just feels like film train spotting to me do you know that you, it's but there is a bit of it though I mean I maybe I know I just this is just I, I, I think back to the final scene in the film where she opens up the door and she goes out and big light gushes yeah. in that kind of reminded me of Godfather Part 2 now just as you say it like because the bit where you know he's in the in the scene in Godfather Part 2 when he's in the bed on his own and the light kind of like shines in on top of him and you can see the outline of the Statue of Liberty. Of the Statue of Liberty. I, I know, look, yeah. I'm, maybe I'm, I'm just literally just pulling this out of my hat now. Yeah. Like, but it does. I do feel there was okay. some similarity. I don't know if that was the DP's kind of fault. Not fault, but... No, no. I, it's, it, it was not, certainly not the intention. Right. right. So I can promise you that. that yeah. what, what it was was to try and go after a certain emotional moment, which yeah, yeah. is when she crosses that doorway, right? And um, second reason is it was a practical reason, which is, you know, you open that door and behind that white... She shot there's it was, nothing there it was Montreal so, <laughs> so that, that um, that's partly you know as always you know these ideas which in retrospect look like pure aesthetic decisions yeah, yeah. have a very practical component yeah, yeah. in them we had to find a way of delivering her into the States which was um, emotional you know rather yeah, than yeah. it being just about sailing past the Statue of Liberty which you couldn't do without it being cliched yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and somehow also then there's, there's, the, there's that you know there's that scene which Partly the complication and the relationship in the film to emigration not being a single thing, but being a little bit more complicated. Yeah. That, it, that it was very important. And that was in the novel, and we were really keen to hold on to it in the film. So that when you can counter that scene and the sort of almost rapture of her walking through the door yeah. slow motion with all those old guys coming in on Christmas Day in an opposite direction, mm. coming in a door where they are, um, you know, like this great silent mass and yeah. she's looking with awe at them and, and yeah. kind of asking the naive question why don't they just go home and, mm. you know that you see the whole other side of emigration for people who you know it hasn't quite worked out for in and in lots of ways for that labouring class that went there or, or that built motorways in yeah, England yeah, yeah. Um, it was a very very tough end of life and there's a lot of shame attached to it and people couldn't come back so yeah Hopefully there's ways in which we sort of play with the light and shade of the of the whole issue and express some of the complications of it, you know. Hmm. Would you make another, I mean, are you going to leave it another 12 years before you make another Irish film? <laughs> I have no idea. I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. I really do hope not. Yeah. Because actually I get, I get fired up about Irish material in a way that... Um, 
uh, I don't you know. When you're, you whenever you're making a film, you're, yeah. you're you're kind of making a secret film behind it. You're hoping that there's something which is it, it's it's about as opposed to just being about a genre, mm. you know. And that's what that's the thing I think with Brooklyn is we all felt a responsibility to get it right because mm. of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people yeah. who left the country with little more than a suitcase in their hand. And still so are. And still, still are. are still, are, awesome. still are. Still are. Still are. And. Um, so that gives you that focuses your mind, you know. Mm. But um, but it's you, you know it's always about finding a piece of material which is fresh and feels like it hasn't been told before, and that you've got something to contribute to it. Mm. Very cool. Okay, John Carroll, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.